Historians studying the Dominion War will sometimes make reference to a little-known event that occurred in 2374, the second year of the conflict. Merkin Vrinak, a Romulan senator returning to Romulus from a diplomatic meeting on Sukara, was killed in a tragic shuttle accident. But the death of Vrinak might not even have been the historical footnote it is today were it not for what happened immediately after. The Romulan Star Empire, which up until this point had been steadfastly neutral in the ongoing conflict, declared war on the Dominion and its allies. This would prove to be the turning point in the war, which would ultimately conclude with the victory of the United Federation of Planets, the Klingon Empire, and the Romulans. There's nothing to suggest any kind of correlation between the death of the Senator and the Romulan declaration of war, but the timing has been enough to lead to several conspiracy theories. The most common is that Vrinak had uncovered evidence of a preemptive strike to be launched by the Dominion against the Romulan Empire, and he was assassinated to prevent this evidence from being revealed. Some go even further, and claim that this evidence was given to Vrinak, or perhaps even fabricated, by members of Starfleet Intelligence. While neither the Romulan nor Federation government has ever commented on this directly, if we accept the premise, and operate on the assumption it's entirely true, it does open up an interesting question. What if whatever evidence supposedly convinced the Romulans to enter the war was never found, and the Federation and Klingons were forced to continue the fight alone? On this episode of Incoming, that's the hypothetical we'll be discussing. First though, let's quickly review the situation at this point in the war. In 2374, it was generally assumed that the defeat of the Federation Klingon Alliance was a matter of when and not if. In nearly every major fleet engagement, the Dominion consistently emerged triumphant, inflicting significant casualties on their adversaries. Only in the operation to retake Deep Space Nine did the Federation achieve a notable victory. And while it was enormously significant, restoring Starfleet's control over the Bajoran wormhole, and preventing the entry of more Dominion reinforcements to the Quadrant, it was not enough to affect the greater strategic situation. Instead, the redeployment of so many starships to take part in this campaign left many other sectors undermanned. Dominion counterattacks, most notably the rapid conquest of Beta Zed, threatened the very heart of the Federation. Vulcan, Andor, Teller, and Alpha Centauri were all within striking distance by the Dominion, and repeated Federation counterattacks failed to regain the initiative. So if we imagine, then, that Romulan reinforcements are not coming, what happens next? Well, without the intervention of some unexpected third party, a Borg incursion into Dominion space, or some act by the Q, for example, it's very hard to see a path to victory for the Federation. I think the war, or at least its major campaigns, would have at most gone on for another year, and it would see some of the most historically important Federation worlds become battlegrounds. Who knows the order in which these battles would have occurred, but I don't think it's a huge stretch to say that if Vulcan itself was attacked, its government might not have seen the logic of an unconditional surrender. And Doria, by contrast, would have likely fought on to the end, perhaps even forcing the Dominion to destroy it utterly, lest it become the site of a protracted guerrilla war. Teller might go either way. Its people are known for their stubbornness and pride, but it's difficult to know to what extent that might influence the decision of whether or not to surrender. That only leaves Earth as one of the core Federation worlds, and I'm happy to agree with Quark on this one. I believe humanity would have become as nasty and violent as the most bloodthirsty Klingon. I can't imagine Earth surrendering, but how the Dominion would respond to that is another question. The Dominion's plans for the post-war Alpha Quadrant have never been fully revealed, but we do know there was at least high-level discussions advocating for the eradication of Earth's population. Perhaps ironically, it was Gul Dukat, one of the most hated men in the galaxy, who seemingly argued against this. A true victory is to make your enemies see they were wrong to oppose you in the first place. To force them to acknowledge your greatness. Then you kill them. Only if it's necessary. Had the Dominion leadership been given the chance to put this theory into practice against a hostile population on Earth, who knows how it might have gone. But I think we can say with a bit of certainty that the solar system would have been an active war zone for quite a while. The Dominion would have certainly started to destroy the system's infrastructure. The Jupiter Research Station, the colonies in the asteroid belt, the Utopia Planitia fleet yards over Mars, and countless others. There would certainly be prolonged resistance on Mars itself, and eventually Luna when it was attacked, but lacking the same importance as Earth, the Dominion would be less reticent in annihilating these worlds from orbit. That would leave only a last stand over Earth, composed of whatever remnants of Starfleet couldn't flee the system in time and Space Dock 1. Once the Dominion had achieved orbital supremacy, the San Francisco Fleet Yards, Starfleet Academy, Starfleet Headquarters, and the Office of the Federation President in Paris would likely all be destroyed in the opening bombardment. Jem Hadar and Cardassian shock troops would then be landed in enormous numbers. 
I think the fighting would continue for quite a while, maybe even far, far longer than the Dominion expected. And in this case, their initially limited orbital bombardment in an effort to force a surrender would quickly be expanded to include major urban centers, or even sites of historical importance, such as the Warp 5 complex near Bozeman, Montana. Ultimately though, whether through some sort of formal surrender or total eradication, Earth would be conquered. And this would likely be enough to end the war. I don't want to discount the hundreds of other member worlds across the remainder of the Federation, many of which I'm sure would be adamant in keeping up the struggle, but without Earth, any hopes of victory vanish. The Federation would begin to splinter, with many worlds and colonies hoping to sign a separate peace with the Dominion, in the interest of ensuring better treatment in the post-war era. That leaves the Romulan Star Empire as the only major power in the Alpha or Beta Quadrants not wholly subsumed within the Dominion's sphere of influence. Now few people respect the Romulans more than I do, but even I must admit they are at their strongest when they can use their talents for espionage and political maneuvering. When confronted by a single unified rival that now extends across almost the entire Romulan border, they have no chance. The conquest of the Romulan Star Empire would be brutal and bloody on both sides, but it would be brief. But while the Federation and its allies would have certainly have lost without the intervention of the Romulans, I'm not sure the Dominion would have won. During the conflict, the Changeling founders of the Dominion were infected by a morphogenic virus that would have ultimately destroyed them had it not been cured. If we assume that the Dominion would have been unable to develop a cure before the founders were annihilated, then the situation would have become even worse. Without their spiritual foundation, their literal gods, the Vorta would have struggled to keep the Dominion together. I think it's very possible that this enormous superpower would begin to splinter, slowly at first and then faster and faster. Eventually, the supplies of Ketracel White needed to maintain discipline within the Jem'Hadar would be insufficient. Once this tipping point was reached, a civil war within the Dominion would occur, further aggravating the problem and accelerating it. The entirety of the Jem'Hadar would become a howling, screaming mass of fury, rampaging across every quadrant of the galaxy. Only the Borg Collective would be safe, while the decimated worlds of the Alpha and Beta Quadrants would be especially vulnerable. The galaxy would then find itself in a dark age, with every major interstellar civilization, if not entirely destroyed, at least so severely damaged that the recovery, if achievable at all, would take at least several centuries. The Borg would be free to expand with little resistance in this new environment, ultimately assimilating the entire galaxy. However, I'm not sure if things would ever get this far because I severely doubt that the Romulans would have just sat by and let the Federation be destroyed. The Romulans would have not been oblivious to the interstellar political situation that a Dominion victory would create. Regardless of whether Vreenak was carrying secret evidence or not, I think a Romulan intervention was inevitable. The fact that when they did enter the war, the Romulan navy was able to strike 15 bases almost immediately says to me that they had been planning their entry for quite some time and had secretly been mobilizing. The Romulan government was likely just waiting until the moment when the Federation's position was at its most dire. If Starfleet was truly desperate, then the Romulans could make extravagant demands in exchange for an alliance. However, we also need to remember that Romulan aspirations sometimes far outstrip their ability or judgment. They have a real tendency to overreach or pursue unrealistic objectives. It's not out of the realm of possibility for the Romulans to completely misjudge the situation, enter the war too late, and be unable to affect the outcome. So if indeed Vrenak was assassinated, perhaps we should all be grateful. But that of course is just my opinion. And even though I was just talking to the Guardian of Forever and it said I absolutely nailed this, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Do you agree with my assessment? What do you think happened to Senator Vrenak? And actually, one other question for you. As we'll soon mention in the outro, this is the pilot episode for a new series in which we consider the big what-ifs from across alternate worlds. And there are two ways I think we could present this series. The first is what we just did, a more analytical analysis in which we review the evidence, present it to you, and include maybe a few different conclusions. The second would be something not entirely dissimilar to our regular episodes, in which we present the same material as if it had actually happened. Each format has its own benefits and drawbacks, so if you have a preference for one over the other, please let me know in the comments below. And until next time, this has been Incoming. What you just watched is the pilot episode for a new series we're calling Alternate History, where the Templin Institute investigates the many what-ifs from across alternate worlds. This is one of four new shows we're releasing this week, and on Friday, our patrons will have the chance to vote on which ones become a regular addition to Incoming. If you'd like to take part, a pledge of just $2 gets you a vote.